Welcome to episode 42 of Inside Politics, for teens by teens, where I explore the politics and issues impacting your generation. I'm your host, Christina Lee, and today I've invited Sarah Briner, Research Director at Center for Responsive Politics. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So let's jump right in. So could you start by talking about what you do at the Center for Responsive Politics? Sure. So um, the Center for Responsive Politics, which many people know best through our website, opensecrets.org, uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, um, good government group. Uh, you could call us a watchdog. Uh, and we collect uh, lots of data on the ways in which money could potentially influence political outcomes. Um, we collect this from the federal government, from some um, federal agencies, uh, and compile it, um, slice it and dice it, add value to it, uh, and display it in such a way as to give um, users and uh, voters information in a way that they can use uh, to understand Sort of the forces that are trying to manipulate their vote and influence political outcomes. Understood. So I guess like what sorts of methods do you use to analyze this sort of data? Oh, that's a great question and it depends on the data and the question we're trying to answer. Um, I think that one of my favorite just simple ways to analyze data uh, in the world in which I operate is, <laughs> and this sounds totally 101, but it's just to sort as <laughs> largest to smallest, smallest to largest, and see like, oh, that's weird. These donations are outside of the legal limit. What's going on here? Um, or, oh, that's strange. This is a new donor who suddenly um, is donating millions of dollars and we've never seen them in the data before. What's going on here? Just through doing that, uh, we've broken stories about um, foreign actors making their first donations in the, in the federal political system. Um, and so I, I like to view it as kind of anomaly hunting. Uh, and I think that that can be really powerful and pretty simple for um, answering uh, questions about uh, your own data set. Yeah, definitely. And I guess like now that data science is like a big buzzword um, and something that a lot of people are doing more research into like innovating the field. Um, I guess, like, how involved does your data analysis get? Sure. Um, so, you know, my background, my, I have a doctorate in political science, uh, so I have a pretty wide-ranging toolbox that I know how to use, but one of the things that you learn pretty, pretty quickly working with data is that oftentimes sort of fancy cutting-edge technology can be used um, to sort of make the work that you do look more impressive than it actually is, and I think that the most uh, important thing to keep in mind is like, what story do I think this data is trying to tell and who am I trying to reach with it? Um, so really trying to use and access data in a more human-centered approach, um, making sure that you're not sort of preordaining answers, um, but also uh, approaching the data in a way that isn't alienating to people. Um, so we do use things like machine learning, uh, to kind of look for connections between data sets. Um, I certainly use uh, sort of regression models and the ilk um, to do analyses for some of my longer form um, writing. But I think that uh, investigative research, uh, almost from a journalistic place, is probably one of the most powerful tools. And that's something that you don't need to sort of get a data science degree to do. Mm, understood. And I guess like as this, um, as the field of data science continues to grow and evolve, how do you see that benefiting your work? Oh gosh. Um, well, one amazing thing that you can do with data science tools is create awesome visuals um, and like network analyses and graphics, uh, which really can bring data to life. Um, and I think that that can be just a really powerful way of educating users about um, the, the dataverse in which you're operating. Uh, so that's exciting. I love working with people who can um, use tools to make those kind of awesome graphics. Uh, another thing is that I think that as people become more expert in analyzing data, it is great to have a wider audience of people who are critically examining the work that you do to make sure that it stands up 
um, to rigorous analysis. Um, so it's great to have other people to some extent fact checking the kind of work that we do. Um, and I, I always appreciate that. And I think that um, that's one of the ways that it evolves us and pushes us forward. Um, but, you know, I can think of exciting things I'd love to do with um, similarity analysis, uh, with um, network analysis, like I said, I think the machine learning approaches that we use could be extended into other areas of our work. So there's lots of different places I, I think that um, I'm eager to grow in as we sort of become more expert in that space. Mm -hmm. And I guess like what, so after you do your research and you have all this quantitative, I guess, like results, how do you translate that into your news articles? Yeah. Um, so I think there's two parts to that. One of which is that campaign finance itself is a pretty, um, I think, confusing and oftentimes alienating topic area. So the kind of words that we use in Washington, like, you know, just super PAC or PAC, uh, campaign limit, party committee, those are not, those are buzzwords. I mean, they don't sound like buzzwords because people kind of know what a party committee is. People kind of know what a super PAC is, but um, I think that it's important. That's kind of step one is making sure that you are talking about things in a way that's approachable uh, to people who aren't steeped in this and beltway insiders. The second is that there are so many different audiences. Uh, I think for academic research that I do, um, it's, it's, it can by, kind of be a struggle actually to jump back and forth between academic and non-academic audiences because what is implicit in an academic scholarly paper uh, that you would be doing um, you know, some kind of uh, causal analysis or, or modeling um, is totally foreign <laughs> in a journalistic um, article. So I think that really it's it's great to work with people who can understand both and can read um, some of the analyses that I might write or, or see and say, hey, I'm going to pull out the most interesting thing about this. Um, so I think that kind of working with people who quote unquote speak those languages uh, can be a way to to take something that is complex and um, and, and make it understandable to a wider audience. Um, but really that's just about being careful and being conscientious and being respectful of the fact that, um, you know, different people are coming from different places and we shouldn't assume that everyone knows what we're talking about. Definitely. And I guess, how do you see the relevance of these data driven and like based in data investigative reportings, um, like, like as relevant to maybe like this rise in misinformation and disinformation? Oh, I kind of wish that um, accurate data-driven reporting could solve um, what ails us in society. Uh, you know, that you could just put out a um, sort of fact-based uh, numbers-driven counter or, or fact check in response to something that's misinforming people. Um, but unfortunately, I think that the evidence points to that just not necessarily working, um, to people seeking out different news sources, depending on their priors. Um, so I, I, I worry that, you know, rigorous analysis and, and good nonpartisan unbiased work um, can sometimes be drowned out a little bit by the cacophony of um, partisan actors. Uh, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Um, I just think that it's really, really, really important in this moment to be mindful of your biases, uh, to sort of investigate all sides fairly and equally, um, to not treat things as equivalent uh, and when they're not, um, and to just, just recognize that although you might feel like you are screaming really loud about how something is <laughs> is wrong or, um, um, or detrimental to society's demo democratic health, for example. Uh, it's still fighting the good fight, and everyone there's always an appetite for accurate, non-biased reporting. Um, I it is a it is a worry of mine uh, that breathlessness will overtake um, steady accurate analysis, but it, I just am not in a position yet where I'm ready to give up on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess if, uh, I think like the general assumption is that like data is like not biased, right? But like, is <laughs> there, like, 
is there any like do are the numbers ever biased and like do the analysis techniques ever have a bias because i know that when machine learning gets like when you train a machine learning algorithm it uses like existing or prior data so i guess like how do you deal with like making sure that your analysis isn't biased that is a great question, especially for our times. Um, I will remind, I, I think back when I think about things like this to a data group that I belonged to um, years and years ago that was trying to decide where they would have their meetings. Um, this was a weeknight meeting in DC and they would bounce around different locations and they pulled the membership of the data group to see, oh, look, everyone, most of the people in this data group live in sort of Northwest DC. And if you know anything about the DC area, you know that Northwest DC is kind of the wealthier, whiter, um, affluent part of the city. And they said, okay, well, look, we use data science to solve this problem. We're gonna have more meetings in Northwest DC because that's where our membership is. And I was thinking that whole time, like, well, that's a problem. <laughs> it's, a, it's great that you're having meetings where people can get to them, but that's meeting your existing membership needs, which is already very privileged. Um, so the fact that your membership is based here doesn't mean that you need to have more meetings there. It means that you need to analyze why we have more people living in this part of town um, and potentially have the meeting somewhere else so that you can bring in a more diverse um, group of people outside of the Sort of universe in which you're accustomed. So I think that that is really important when doing it. I mean, you know, that, that's an example. Uh, but I think that I think to that example about how data itself is selected. Um, all data has a has a bias um, because you have selection problems. Um, it's so rare that you're able to look at a comprehensive data universe that is complete for what it's supposed to be measuring. Even in campaign finance data, which I work in. Um, which is a complete universe of all campaign donations, it's actually not because we don't have any information about um, the, as much information about people who give in small amounts. And we have no information about people who don't give at all. And so that those people are part of our campaign finance universe, even though they're not giving money. And I think that being aware of that, being sort of recognizing what you're looking at is something that a good data scientist needs to do um, when they're embarking on any kind of project uh, and you need to talk to the experts who are well versed in, in your data um, to understand kind of what's not being included. So I actually take issue with the assertion that data is unbiased. <laughs> um, any fact can be easily is all about context. Humans are a verbal species, data is descriptive, um, and I don't care how many times you tell me that a model is causal, uh, that model is built by a person and um, there are motivations in any person. So I just think that that, does, that doesn't necessarily mean that what you're doing is wrong or that that's a problem. I just think that it's something that people need to be very conscientious of and recognize that um, we're people. Um, and so people bring with them assumptions. Yeah, definitely. And I guess like as the average citizen, when you consume, um, I guess like data-driven pieces, what should we keep in mind in order to just like make sure that we we take away something that's like reasonable rather than just like, I don't know, maybe like taking it at face value. Yeah. Um, so I like to think about the content that I see on social media sites as an example of how people should consume media because um, I kind of, I think the the truism or what have you is trust but verify. I think that now it's not, we shouldn't do that anymore. It should be verify then trust <laughs> uh, because there are so many actors out there that are very um, skillful in manipulating their appearance to seem as though they're unbiased or neutral actors. There are an enormous number of quote unquote media outlets on Facebook and, and um, Facebook for the large extent, but also Twitter and Google that are actually like run by random people in basements in states completely outside of the realm in which they're supposed to be discussing, you know, the news like the Grand Rapids Press or what have you is not actually a news outlet. It's some dude in a basement in Chicago. And so um, I, I just think that verifying what you're looking at <laughs> is, is the first step uh, and before you can trust. And I actually don't think 
you know, I think that a lot of people say, you know, get two sides. Um, if you read a Fox News article, read a CNN article. Uh, I don't necessarily think that that's even necessary. I think that um, people can make uh, good informed decisions uh, without having to seek out alternatives on every single piece of information that they encounter, um, especially if you're inclined to trust government data or state data or a specific or NPR or some specific news outlet that you know provides information um, that is legitimate and fact checked. Uh, I don't think you need to like necessarily seek out alternatives to that. That's where we start to get into this kind of like there's two sides to everything, including the truth. <laughs> um, and while that is, uh, that sounds appealing, sometimes like it isn't true. <laughs> like so sometimes the scientific consensus is enough and you don't need to get like the counterpart conspiracy theory to kind of uh, make you be a more considered consumer of news. Um, so I, I think that verifying that the sources that you're looking at are meeting basic journalistic standards um, and then proceeding from there. Recognize that anyone who gives a quote from any po political office has an agenda, whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> and I think that being, um, you know, this sounds trite, but uh, I, and I really don't wanna, you know, have her go on about the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Antonin Scalia friendship as though it's going to solve democracy. Um, but to some degree, I think that 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 relationship, their friendship, and like, look, people from different sides of the aisle can be friends. Isn't that great? Uh, that misses the point. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia had deep arguments um, and disagreements about important issues. And so that friendship was built on, you know, respect, but also respectful disagreement um, and, and discussion and growth. So it's not just that you have a polite conversation with someone, it's that you, you know, put your opinion out there and get pushback and come to some sort of collaborative um, discourse, dis, uh, discourse um, about political issues. I think that that's much more important than just saying, hey, let's all be friends, uh, regardless of your political affiliation. So um, I think that the way that people talk about that kind of misses the point. And I think that that's sort of what I was saying about like, don't just trust the media. Um, <laughs> or don't just, like you can have, you can listen to one source of news recognizing that there might be something that you're missing. Um, and you can still have strong opinions about that news just so long as you recognize that that is where you're coming from. Yeah, so like going back to your point about like, reading like two sides I think like the fallacy is that like everything's on a spectrum right and the truth is like at the middle but like it could like it's it's more than like a 1d thing right like it's like multi-dimensional so like the truth could be like over here or something or maybe like you can't even like geometrically realize it yeah you can't I think I think that's exactly right you can't realize the truth <laughs> um like I could tell you you know my my this rock is hard but like what does that actually mean but then also I don't want to get too into this sort of like <laughs> uh, postmodern theory, nothing is what it seems sort of analysis of news. Yeah. Um, because uh, when it comes down to it, we live in a world where um, facts do matter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are, for example, something like global warming, like there's a lot of agreement in the scientific community about that issue, COVID. There's more disagreement because it's newer, but there's a fair amount of disagreement about what causes COVID and how it's transmitted at this point. And so this isn't something that we need to have a reasoned debate about. <laughs> and so, you know, just because we might not be at the truth or we may never know the entire truth doesn't mean that we can just, we just throw up our hands and say, like, we're never going to know um, because what is knowledge? <laughs> so, um, actually, for crisis time. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Nice. All right. And I guess like pulling back to today's context um, with the election coming up, how do you see, um, I guess, like campaign finance accountability contributing to the election? Oh, man. Um, I think that uh, the 
short-lived uh, hullabaloo about uh, Trump's tax, tax returns, short-lived because he got COVID like two days later, uh, <laughs> was um, indicative of the fact that, that public access to information is really important. Um, that was information that people had been seeking for years. And when it came out, there was a lot of anger. Um, there was a lot of skepticism about whether he paying that amount of money is legal. It was actually a really good example of the fact that although he fills out um, federally mandated public disclosure forms, those themselves have limitations uh, because they missed a lot of the kind of information that people got from the tax returns um, that was helpful in understanding his financial picture. Uh, so I think that that's a good that's a good example of how knowledge um, and accountability can happen. As for campaign finance, I think that much of the campaign finance story happens in January, in February, when membership is um, decided, when committees are formed, and when lobbying happens. Um, who's going to get those meetings? Uh, whose policies are going to rise to the top of the agenda? Um, if the polls hold and the Democrats sweep, um, then that is going to be a huge change uh, in the power dynamics in Washington. And with that comes opportunities for people who have been sidelined for four years to get their agenda in front of people with power. Um, and that is not going to be a <laughs> process by which like the best idea wins. Uh, there are power dynamics on both side of the, sides of the, the aisle. And so it's important to see like, who are the biggest bankrollers to the Democratic Party? Um, what might they expect in return? There are laws preventing quid pro, quo, quid, quid pro quo and pay to play type consequences, but um, it's up to the citizenry and, and journalists to make sure that those laws are um, monitored uh, so that we don't see undue influence. If the polls don't hold and the Republicans, you know, keep the Senate and the presidency, uh, then similar, like um, who are they, their biggest bankrollers? Uh, it's going to be a little bit trickier because they already hold power. So there won't be like that kind of obvious new shift. <laughs> um, but still, like uh, there will be groups trying to get their agenda passed. And it's just important to see that that is um, not the result of donating large sums of money to the victor. Understood. And I guess like as a final message um, to Gen Z, given your experience with everything, do you have like any specific uh, words of wisdom <laughs> to impart? Oh God. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that old. So I was like, <laughs> don't. It's like, oh, you youngins. Um, <laughs> I guess like, I, you have everything you need, you know, I don't, listen to people like me or people who are older than me to tell you how things should be done. Like we, the, the system is set up to prevent you from making the kind of change that you might dream of making. And it is not our place to use our words to discourage you from making that change. Um, I, I just would urge people to try not to be limited by the system into which you we'll see yourselves arriving. Um, and to say like, you know, you say that I need to raise money in these ways to get elected. Well, screw it. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna do it this way. You saw AOC do that. I mean, she's technically a millennial like me, um, but so I claim her <laughs> and the others in her class. But um, but you see people like that, Bernie Sanders, change and and to some extent donald j trump um changing the game for how you need to be a politician and a powerful person in washington to the dismay of people who have held on to that power for decades and so i don't think that it's your need to listen to your elders um into how you need to change the political system i think that uh you have what that what is needed to do that um already and so that is my sort of my two cents about that. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining me here today. Um, great insights. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And me I'll too. see everybody next time on Inside Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Christina. Thank you so much for watching Inside Politics. 
and please feel free to check out the rest of the interviews on my channel. See you next time!